Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Briz Science for August 2017. Uh, we are hosted tonight by the University of Queensland and here at the wonderful The Edge at the State Library of Queensland. My name is Joel Gilmore. I'll be your MC for this evening. And welcome to Briz Science, which is Brisbane's free monthly lecture series on science, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also fantastic communicators to share their work. Well, you'll see. Um, I'd like to start tonight by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting this evening and pay my respect to elders both past and present. I also want to recognise those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is leaving a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. So tonight, we are going to be taking science local. For those watching online, that means Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Uh, we are going to be looking at the wonders of Moreton Bay. We're going to be looking at its role in science education and communication. We're going to be looking at what's being done to conserve this fantastic area. And we are going to be talking about some of the lesser known inhabitants of the bay, by which I don't mean the lowly PhD students. Um, and I'm going to be making a really strong effort to limit my fish puns wherever possible. So we are going to have, we have four fantastic speakers tonight who I'll introduce briefly just before they speak, after which we'll have a bit of a panel discussion. And that's your opportunity to, opportunity to ask questions. So you would have received on the way in a piece of paper, which you can write your question down on, and then we will come around and collect those and get to as many of those questions as we can. Alternatively, you can ask questions on Twitter, hashtag BrizScience, but it's amazing Twitter only works if your phone is set to silent. So you should probably check that now. Great. Um, and then after the talk, we will have some food and drink outside, complimentary from BizScience. So we'd love for you to come outside, join us, and opportunity to ask more questions of our speakers. They'll be out there fishing for compliments. And uh, if they don't see you, just give them a little wave, and that always gets their attention. Thank you, I'm here all night. OK, on that note, I would like to welcome back to Briz Science. Uh, you might remember him from the talk we had earlier this year on sharks, Dr Ian Tibbetts, who's the director of the Centre for Marine Science at the University of Queensland. But tonight, he is going to be talking about fishy goings on beneath the bay. Please welcome Dr Ian Tibbetts. Thank you. Thank you. I think I might have turned my thing off, no, I didn't. Hello. <laughs> Um, yeah, before I get started, I just want to um, say a couple of thanks uh, why we're here and why we're going to find out a bit about life beneath the bay. And I guess um, thanks to Martin Natural, who's the director of the Marine Science Institute at Plymouth University in the UK. I go and visit uh, Martin quite frequently. And he had this idea to describe the life beneath Plymouth Sound to folk over there in Plymouth. And it seemed to work really well, so I thought we might sort of repeat it over here. I've, I've told him I've stolen his idea and he's quite happy about that. So that's, the, that's one of the reasons we're here. Also, um, some of the activity we've been doing at the, the Centre for Marine Science at UQ in collaboration with the Goodman Foundation has led to, this is one of the many activities we do in terms of, in terms of outreach. So thank you all for coming tonight. That's really good. Thank you to my colleagues for coming out to speak. Now, my tale is relatively simple. I'm a simple fisher. Um, I study fish a lot, I go fishing sometimes, and I'm always surprised when I get lots of bites, but I never get lots of fish. So there's this inherent sort of question in my mind about what went on. And as technology has changed, so we're actually able to um, gather a vision of fish doing things beneath the waves that hitherto we weren't able to do. And so this study I'm going to relate now is part of an honours uh, project by, by one of my students and is part of a a long-standing interest I have in, in what happens when you throw a bait into the water. So hopefully you'll, you'll find it interesting. So I'm going to talk for you, first show a few slides, and then there's a couple of short videos just to illustrate the point graphically with uh, some of the differences I'm going to point out. So anyway, so who, who stole my bait is the, the main thing. Yeah, that was my big question. I want to know what was going on when we were having these episodes where you go fishing and suddenly the bait's gone. What happened? Why didn't I catch a fish? So, this is, I don't know where it is, I don't know what they're doing, all right, but certainly in terms of competition for fishing, that is a, that is a crowded spot to fish, whereas this, uh, 
this, uh, this adventurous fisher person is going out on a shore that's relatively uncrowded. So there's obviously differences around the, the uh, bay, there's differences around the world in terms of the intensity of fishing. And this was what we thought might be something that might be driving this. It's something to do with the experiences that fish are having that is allowing them to feed on bait that has a hook attached to it without actually getting caught. So it was either a case of particularly smart fish being able to manipulate the bait carefully, or maybe fish, uh, little fish coming in and stealing the bait. And this has ecological consequences, which I'll, I'll talk about also. So if we zoom in, this is a very blurry shot, so I stole this from some Google Earth or something or other. You might recognize Morton Bay here, you're going to see that a few times tonight. Here's North Stradbroke Island. We're going to focus in on Amity here. Here's my great graphic sequence. Look at that. Oh, slipped. It's up there. Here we go. We're going into Amity. There we go. There's Amity Point. And here we have Amity Point. I'm not sure how many folks have been to Amity, but it's a, it's a lovely, lovely area of uh, Morton Bay. Um, there's some jetties here. There's some rock groins. And there's a seawall that runs around here. And here is lots of public access. Lots of people fish there all the time. There's boats launched there. Everyone's fishing. And then up here is an area where there are lots of private residences where access is limited and fishing is much more sporadic. So we took these two areas and said, well, one area is a high fishing impact area, the other is low. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down and have a look and see what's going on underneath the sea. So we use one of these. You're going to see um, uh, Tim's, well, two Tim's over there are going to uh, show you a bit more stuff about bruvs, which are baited remote underwater videos. So here we have what's known as a stereo bruv. Here's a <coughs> GoPro. Everyone's heard of GoPros now, I think. A couple of GoPros. And there's a reference camera in the middle that's sending a live feed up so we can see what's happening to the bait while we sit there and grab stereo images. We grab stereo images so we can play those back on split screens and be able to measure the length of organisms that are coming in. That's a useful technique for us, but really, really useful. Um, so a live feed camera, sending a signal up the surface, make sure everything's working out all right. Remote to bait, bait deployment. So here's actually a cut off fishing rod, which is taking reality a little bit far. But anyway, so they'd be filming before the bait was introduced, and then the bait gets reeled down there, and it's sitting on a hook that lacks a, a point and barb. So we didn't want to catch the fish, we didn't want to hurt anybody. We just want to simulate fishing, so it had a weight and had a hook, just as you would use going fishing, and baited with a pilchard. Face it down current, and then any of the animals will come into the, the current in front of you. And then this is what we found. If we have a look at here, low fishing effort areas, so where we were up near the private residences where not much fishing went on, the bait was very rapidly consumed by things, particularly brim. Here's a tusk fish, wrasse, and this is a little thread fin. So these fish really quickly honed in the bait and, and, and took it. Whereas if we went to the high fishing area, we still saw lots of these things, but they weren't actually engaging with the bait. They were standing by and letting lots of little ones come in. This is a little thing called a stripey. This is a leather jacket. This is a little uh, cod. And these things were coming in and nibbling the bait. And so white, you might think, well, what's, you know, what's the... What's the, what's the problem with that? Well, what we actually also found was that some of the fish coming in to feed on this bait were things that do important roles in, in systems underneath the bay. There were fish such as rabbit fish, and rabbit fish are important grazers. Right? Even parrot fish were coming in. Parrot fish are the quintessential herbivorous fish. They shouldn't feed on other fish, but where baits were being regularly introduced, then their feed was being supplemented. They weren't susceptible to feeding. There's no way they could get hooked. But they were coming and eating this food. And if they're eating that food, that means they're not doing the job they're supposed to be doing. All right? So what's happening is you get this ecological service that's provided by the fishes that isn't taking place because of this problem of the, of the bait introduction. Is it a problem? I don't know. There's certainly some interesting follow-up questions from this. So, What's going on? Well, basically, fish are smart. You may have heard stories about goldfish with three-second memories. Fish are really smart. They can observe other fish behaving and modify their own behavior. So they can see fishes avoiding a bait and then learn that they should not touch that bait. And this seems to be what's going on. The fish are learning. They're passing these signals through the community. 
So a hook bait represents a very strong negative reinforcement. If you see something that takes one of these baits and then suddenly it starts wriggling and thrashing and making a noise, if it can make a noise, then it's going to avoid that bait. Yeah? And the others are going to learn from that. And that learning then gets passed in among other fish. So your bait is removed by pickers and the chompers look on. We'll see a video of this in a moment. So this sort of system is quite interesting. The other interesting thing, I suppose, if you think back about where these sites are, the high fish and low fish, and consider these fish are relatively mobile, then the possibility exists, and we haven't tested this yet, we want to go and test it, is that fish may even have geographic location specific behaviors. That is, in one area they do one thing, in another area they do another. And that's kind of a really interesting question that we're going to be tackling in the future. So, implications, effects of angling are more complex than merely removal of large, large fish. And angling takes more fish from Morton Bay, this is recreational angling, it takes more fish from Morton Bay than all of the commercial fishing that goes on there. Yeah? This is the scale of what the impact <laughs> anglers can have on the system. And you've also got these alt altered ecological services, all right, by virtue of the fish moving off and, and uh, supplementing their food with bait, their feed with bait. So successful st fishing strategies. If you want to go out and catch more fish, fish in a seldom fish place, but not the green zones. Hey, Tim, not the green zones in Morton Bay. So try and find an area where there's not much fishing going on. Use unusual baits. I use bread and cheese. Imagine the series of events that would have to take place for cheese to be accidentally introduced into the environment naturally. A cow falls into the water and then di <laughs> dot, 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 all right? So you can fill in the ellipsis. Bread? I think that's a pretty stretch. But marvelous baits, because they're different baits. But please catch and release if you can, all right? If you like to go fishing, catch and release, use barbless hooks, look after the fish, pop them back. Because they say this uh, activity takes a lot of fish uh, from, from Morton Bay. And these are just a rather couple of things I thought I'd mention on the way through that these are called, referred to in science as food falls, right? So a whale that dies, this one's been eaten by killer whales, will sink to the seabed, then be consumed. So these are discards from uh, trawling, right? So thrown over the side, they're dead, the favored fish have been taken. And these things change the behavior of creatures in the system. So the more we can do to reduce discards, the more we can re do to reduce bait, the less we will impact these natural systems in this wonderful Morton Bay. I think that's my last slide. These are to, uh, this is Andrew Colfax, who worked with me on this project, and also Mick Hayward from CSRO. And it's published here. Uh, you can go off and have a, have a read of that if you like. I'm going to run a couple of videos now just to demonstrate sort of the, the graphic difference between the two. I haven't got this embedded in my presentation, because it was just way beyond me technologically. Someone mentioned Twitter earlier on. I don't understand it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how you tweet or whatever. So can we run the video? We can run either high or low, whichever you like first, but uh, yep. Oh, terrific. So here's a site where lots of high fishing intensity and see there are large fish coming in. So large brim are coming in and they're hovering around looking at it, but it's the little ones that are getting access to the bait. So this is a little cod. These are stripies. There's a little wrasse there. And they get access to this bait and they're chomping it. And you can see there's a brim again coming in, having a look. No, I'll leave that one alone. And it lets these little fish come in. So this is, a, this is a high fishing intensity site. And the system is being entirely dominated by these small fish, which are getting supplemented food. All right. Can we run the, the low fishing intensity? This is a few hundred meters away along that rock wall. And this is where a bait is being introduced in an area where there is low fishing intensity. So fishing happens fairly rarely. Sure. Oh, here we go. Here's the bait again. These pentapodas coming in. These are actually tar wine, relatives of brim. And they're all coming in and basically nailing the bait straight away. So there's no hesitation. Diving straight in. There's a lunar wrasse moving around somewhere. There's a little wrasse. And the bait's almost gone. And the bait's gone. So that was 20 seconds, something like that, compared to 40 seconds where there's still the bait holding around. So thank you for that. Anyway, so. That's the story. When you go fishing in Morton Bay, that rod keeps tapping. You've got a bait down there. If you're fishing in an area where there's lots of fishing going on, there are big fish down there. They just don't want your bait. They know what happens. All right? They've learned. So these learned fish are avoiding you. 
And what's happening is you're devoting your bait to the little pickers, the little fish, which are very happy about it. <laughs> okay? So next time you go fishing, think about what's going on below. Thank you. Please. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. Right, I'd now like to welcome Dr. John Pandolfi, who is the program leader in the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, and also professor with the School of Biological Sciences and Centre for Marine Science at the University of Queensland. And tonight, John is going to be talking about a potted history of the coral reef communities of Moreton Bay. Please welcome Dr. John Pandolfi. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me tonight, Ian. Um, you stole somebody's idea from the UK. I'm just going to steal a couple of minutes of your time. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a history of uh, what's happening with coral communities from about 7,000 years ago until last April. So uh, communities, coral communities in Morton Bay are found uh, throughout the uh, western and some of the eastern. There's Flinders Reef up here. In general, the water quality is much uh, nicer here, and uh, I'm going to take you through some of these, uh, I've sampled some of these reefs along the east. Uh, they're not really uh, in very good condition right now, but we'll get to more of that in a minute. These are some pictures of um, Flinders Reef up on the outer part of the, of the uh, Morton Bay, and you can see beautiful branching corals, fish, uh, lovely sort of um, condition that the reef is in. But when you go a bit um, further into the interior of the bay where circulation is much more restricted, like these uh, corals here from uh, Peel Island, we find that the communities are much more depauperate. We, we don't get those nice branching coral communities like we do just a few kilometers away. And uh, you can see a lot of sediment. Um, in fact, there's been a three to nine-fold increase in sediment accretion over the last 100 years compared to the last 1,500 to 3,000 years on average within the bay. As a matter of fact, mud is now the dominant sediment type within the bay. So um, given that sort of um, scenario, we'd like to know, well, how much has the bay changed? What did it look like in the past? In order to do that, uh, we've been looking at the fossil record. So the fossil record, in this case, is going to be coral death assemblages, which are like the cemeteries in the sea. So we're digging up the, the fossil corals uh, on the seafloor and seeing if we can reconstruct what they used to look like in the past. Um, so we do that by comparing those life and death assemblages. We want to know whether the death assemblage uh, reflects the life assemblage in its composition, the species that are there, the abundance. We also want to know uh, when did these things die? And we want to know when they died because that gives us some insight into why they died. And perhaps identifies drivers and the drivers of change. What have I done? Um, it's skipped a slide. Is the red button the back button? There should be a slide after that. That one is blank. <laughs> okay. It's too bad, we'll just leave it blank, because the, the title of that slide was How to Have a Hot Date with a Fossil Coral. <laughs> <laughs> and the way that you do that is we, we collect those uh, fossil corals, those death assemblages, we bring them to the lab, we take some very nice pristine parts of the skeleton out, and we can actually date them um, using radiometric age dating, using a fancy mass spectro spectrometer machine, mass spectrometry, I probably won't be able to say that. Um, and we can date them very precisely. And I've got a, one of the pictures in that slide shows one of my PhD students holding up a coral. It's about this big. And at the base of the coral, the date is 1980, 1986. And the top of the coral is 1997. So the dating technique is very, very precise. So that's what we did with these. Um, uh, we went around the bay and collected a whole bunch of coral colonies, and we uh, dead coral colonies, and we dated them. And this gives an idea of the distribution of those dates, both in time. This is 5,000 years uh, BCE, and this is the present, the year 2000. So about a 7,000-year time span shown here. These dots correspond to uh, where we collected them with respect to modern sea level. 
and their ages. And what we can see is through time that the um, corals existed in deeper and deeper water. Uh, you say, okay, well, that's because the sea level fell. Well, not quite, because the corals are actually existing now in, a, in deeper water than the sea level has dropped. And the reason for that is that the bay is very sensitive to sea level changes. When sea level is high, there's lots of uh, circulation in the bay, lots of water. So, you know, it's like flushing your toilet, you know, it's lots of circulation. But when sea level is low, it's like you got, you know, a, um, some kind of, you know, block in the system. And so the circulation isn't as good. You get lots of sedimentation in the near surface waters, and so those corals are living a little bit deeper. The other thing you notice here is that the reef the, the uh, mortality, the dates, are concentrated into specific periods. And these are called uh, periods of reef growth, one, two, three, and four. So what that, what that shows you is that sometimes uh, reef growth is, is, is pretty good in the bay in the past, and sometimes it hasn't been so good. So there's this, there's this natural variability. Um, but one of the most important patterns to get from this is that um, when we have the corals from the, from the geological past, they've been dominated by the yellow coral, the branching coral, very uh, fast growing, um, provides lots of structure to the reef, and not so many of these uh, massive corals, these smaller corals that grow slowly. They don't provide as much habitat for fish and other organisms. And throughout most of the geological history in Morton Bay, when there was reef growth, the reef was dominated by the fast-growing acropora, fast-growing branching corals. But in the last 100 years or so, 100, 150 years, there has been a complete and utter um, change, a phase shift, if you will, going from branching corals to these slower-growing massive corals. So uh, to summarize a little bit, the reef development in Morton Bay is very sensitive to subtle environmental changes. Uh, equivalent to a coin toss over the past 7,000 years. So sometimes there was good reef growth and sometimes there wasn't. Um, even when the reefs were well developed, the, the, the bay was very sensitive. Reef growth was governed by small changes in the circulation in the bay. We've had recently an unprecedented shift in community dominance with a significant decline in branching corals. Now, this decline post-dated European settlement of the Queensland coastline and it predated any sort of questions of climate change or increases in disease or ocean acidification or anything like that. So we've done a lot to alter, to degrade the bay in the absence of any of these other stressors like climate change. And we think this is associated with water quality due to land use changes uh, that, that have started in earnest since the, the European colonization. Uh, so I always like to share this diagram that shows all the major players uh, fishing, water quality, habitat destruction, climate change, disease, acidification, these are the things that we tend to um, ascribe to degrading marine habitats. Um, but the, I think the things what we're showing here is that the altered Morton Bay is occurring along this axis when water quality and habitat destruction are actually probably the two primary drivers. Uh, okay, now I just want to bring you a bit up to the present, and uh, we had a major bleaching event worldwide in 2016. Um, it was the worst global bleaching event in the history of, that we know about uh, scientifically. Um, very large portions of the globe were affected. You can see the alert levels that NOAA gave in April of 2000, sorry, in uh, February of 2016. Um, on the Great Barrier Reef, there was incredible bleaching. I'm sure you, you, you wouldn't have heard anything about this. Um, lots of mortality in the north, not so bad in the south. 2017, we had another uh, bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef, back-to-back -back years of, of coral bleaching. So the question is, um, you know, what was happening uh, down south? And here's a map going from Flinders Reef in the north. There's Morton Bay um, with the... Uh, um, reefs inside the bay, and then coming down the coast. We surveyed all these areas and all the way down to the solitary islands and even further south. This is just a blow up of the solitary islands that shows that the intensity of bleaching was much greater in the south than it was in the north, except for Flinders, Flinders Reef actually suffered um, some, some bleaching. 
some significant bleaching. And here's that um, Flinders Reef there. But for the most part, uh, as, we, as we go further and further south, the intensity of the bleaching uh, increases. This shows that not only did the intensity of the bleaching Sorry, this shows that the intensity of the bleaching did increase towards the south. This is a bleaching index, so the larger bars mean more bleaching. But it also shows that um, in Flinders Reef and areas further north, there was a greater number of taxa, a greater number of corals that were subject to bleaching, whereas in the south it was focused on relatively few. And those few taxa tended to be Turbinaria, Stylophora, Parides, and Postulopora. I'm sorry I don't have time to show you pictures of what those look like. But um, these are mostly, um, there's two branching corals, Stylophora and Postulopora. Turbinaria is a plate-like coral, and Parides is a massive coral. Um, so here it is uh, put in context. Here is the uh, severely breached in the north, uh, not so bad in the southern portion of the GBR. And really around Morton Bay in uh, southeast Queensland, not so bad, nothing severely bleached, a lot of reefs not bleached at all. And it's not until you get further south where you get more severely bleached um, colonies. So we didn't do too badly in, in Morton Bay for, for the bleaching. Um, some reef bleaching intensity was stronger in the south, down in uh, um, uh, the Solitary Islands Marine Park. The worst bleaching was focused on relatively few tax, which is good, which means there's other taxa that, that, that actually did well. The long-term effects we're finding were neg negligible for Morton Bay. The, uh, we went back out in October, resurveyed the reefs, and we found mortality to be quite low. Uh, Flinders Reef was the hardest hit, but it, but it recovered. So relatively good news. Now I just want to leave you with a slide with some thoughts because you might be having them already. Is you know with all this climate change in the north, does Morton Bay could Morton Bay actually be a refugia for for the um, things for the reefs up north? There's some there's some arguments for that. The the bay has a long history of reef growth. The bleaching intensity wasn't so bad in the bay as sites further north on the Great Barrier Reef. We had good recovery from the bleaching event. And there's already coral reef species that are migrating south, that, are, that have uh, occupied the reefs of Morton Bay and even those further south. So that's actually already occurring. But what are the cons against that? Well, if you think about the reef growth in Morton Bay, remember I told you it was a flip of the coin, whether we're actually going to get reef growth or not. So it's not an entirely secure situation. Also, reefs are defined by accretion. That is, can they grow up? Can they keep piling up and up? And most of the um, substrates around Morton Bay are mobile sands. So it's very difficult to, for corals to get a hold on mobile sand. They need harder rock. And remember that Morton Bay is highly sensitive to natural and anthropogenic change. So we really have to manage Morton Bay quite carefully with an understanding that subtle changes can bring about big effects. Uh, and lastly, Morton Bay presents relatively few vibrant communities of branching acropora. You might have gone out to Myora Reef and seen some of those. But they're generally the dominant structural components, the bra big branching, fast-growing corals of northern reefs. So there's some pros and there's some cons, uh, and we're trying to investigate that further. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. All right, I would now like to welcome Dr. Tim Stevens, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Environment from Griffith University. And he has been involved in the research, conservation and management of Queensland's marine biodiversity for 35 years. So he is very well placed to talk tonight about patterns and changes in Moreton Bay, Benfoss. Please welcome Dr. Tim Stevens. This thing's on. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Telling everybody how old I am. I really didn't need that. Fine. Um, OK, I want to start with a little bit of background. Um, for the young people in the audience, this was a map that was produced on paper. You may have heard of paper. We don't use it anymore. Uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, but I did spend 11 years working for the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, and in 1996, a branch of the same government department produced this map, uh, which was showing the values of Moreton Bay. And I want to point out a couple of things. So if you look at the, uh, the legend here, we can say, yes, seagrasses, dugong habitat, corals, great. Big blank space in the middle. And I've taken the liberty of just expanding on what it says. 
water. And everywhere else, also water. So that's an indication of where government thinking was at in 1996. Um, now, there was marine, a marine park over Moreton Bay already at this point, which didn't appear at all in the strategic planning document that my own department produced. Uh, they didn't mention it in the document. The boundaries were not recognised. So there was, there was clearly a problem in the way that we think about and we value the bay at that, at that time. And all we had to do was look at a satellite image in order to see that there's clearly a lot more going on in Moreton Bay. So I decided, essentially, uh, to leave the government and be a smart aleck. Sorry. Um, uh, so, I, so I did that. Um, I spent a lot of time dragging videos, uh, video sleds across the bottom of Moreton Bay and produced some habitat maps which were then used um, uh, to construct maps of, of the, the animals and plants that lived on the bottom of Moreton Bay and that was used to improve the Marine Park Zoning Plan, which is fine. I don't want to go on about that. Now, the point about that is that that also, for today's discussion, gave us a baseline. So we have information from 2002 to 2004, when most of these surveys were done, against which we can compare what's going on right now. So that's basically what I want to talk to you about very quickly. So we're going to talk about how things have changed since that time. We're going to talk in a little bit more detail, and many of you may not know, that there are a series of deep reefs on the continental shelf off Moreton Bay, um, and we'll look at the structure of those. And if we have time, and if my videos play, we'll also have a, a very quick discussion about what's going on with some artificial reefs uh, that uh, various government departments have installed in the bay. So, how do we do this stuff? Now, Tim is going to also show you uh, some footage taken from these, these flying arrays, which are essentially put together with toothpaste and string and chewing gum and all sorts of other things, but it has in common the wonderful GoPro. Thank God for GoPros. Um, so, we have a GoPro mounted there, we have some lights, we have another camera so we can see what we're doing at the surface. We have some lasers mounted over here. What they're doing is projecting onto the bottom of the ocean one square metre in line so that we can count accurately what's going on in theory. It doesn't always work out like that. When you come across some fairly high, resolution, uh, high relief reef that you didn't know was there, uh, things can go wrongly quite spectacularly. Tim too is going to show you when things go right. I'm going to show you what happens when things are... You are going to show them what goes when, when things go right, I hope. Um, I, I have spent quite a lot of time crashing into things uh, around Moreton Bay. Parts of the rig start to fall off. Uh, if the sound was on, you'd hear the engine revving quite hard at this point as we try and back down. Uh, but eventually the tow rope snaps uh, and the thing is, uh, is attached to the reef. Uh, I have a very unhappy postgraduate student. Uh, some days later we had to go back and find it. Uh, in 43 metres of water, which was a little bit challenging for a dive. Don't tell the dive regulators about that. Um, and so on. Anyway, mo moving right along. Just some very quick results. So this is what's changed. So the number of species that we could recognise. Um, these are the sites that we went back to see. I'm not going to spend very much time on this, except to point out that there are more yellows and reds on the map than there are greens. So across Moreton Bay and in these areas offshore, we have seen across the board somewhat of a loss of species. I don't know why that's the case and I don't even know how important it is. We're, we're comparing two points in time and I don't know which one is normal and which one is not, but at least I can tell you that things have changed over time and there's obviously a lot more work to do in order to find out why that's the case. So, um, in particular, we have seen losses in some deep water seagrasses that we used to find, particularly up in, uh, in this area. We've, found, we've seen losses in macroalgae that used to exist across the inner part of the bay. The most obvious explanation is the flood events that we had in 2011 and 2012, and that's part of an explanation, but probably not a complete one. In that, a lot of the loss is up here in parts of the bay that were least affected by that mud plume that, that poured out across the bay. And we've also seen a loss of species here offshore in places that were really not affected by that at all. So the, the, the answer to that is I don't have 
an answer. I can just tell you that things have changed and we need to do more work to find out why. Now, in the original set of surveys, and again in these ones, uh, we found some interesting things. We found, for instance, that there is uh, a quite complex array of deep reefs. Now, you can see on this fairly rough bathymetry these sort of ridges here that run up. And these are essentially old coastlines from periods in the past when the sea level was lower. So they're accreted limestones, old coasts, and there are lines of reefs that run up and down there. Great. Many of these are in places too deep for us to dive, so the only way to get at those is to drop cameras on them. I have some video that I will show you, provided that they play. Um, but what we did find, and a little bit paradoxically, is up here in the north, off Morton Island, we had reefs that were dominated by kelp, whereas down here, off the Tweed and off the Gold Coast, there was no kelp growing on those, those deep reefs. These looked a little bit impacted in that they've got uh, a lot of sea urchins, which tend to be a, a marker for, for reefs that have perhaps been overfished, and that was a clue for us. And then further offshore out here, uh, we have deep reefs that are characteristic of other reefs around the world, uh, characterised by sea whips and soft corals and sponges and things like that. Now, fingers crossed that this is going to play. So this is uh, a reef <coughs> off Morton Island, in about 37 metres of water. These are actually quite magic to dive on. So this is about the margin of what we can do uh, in scientific diving. We really can't get very much deeper than this. But as you go down onto these, even when you're still 20 metres above the seabed, the water's usually quite clear out there and you just slowly drop onto these really quite, quite magic worlds. They're well inhabited by fish. They've got a luxuriant cover of kelp. But remember, we're in the subtropics. It's a really funny place to be finding kelp, and it's also occurring much deeper than kelp occurs further south along the Australian coastline. I'm just going to let that play a little bit. So when we get close and the lights pick it up, you can also see there's quite a rich understory underneath the kelp canopy of encrusting organisms like bryozoans and sponges and such like, when that does the right thing, it appears. All of those colours are different kind of encrusting organisms. So that was in about 37 metres of water. This is the same species of kelp, but you see it grows very differently in 65 metres of water. So very clearly, I'm not diving on, on this. Um, but perhaps surprisingly, this is very clear, quite a lot of light down there. This is way beyond the depth that, that, uh, that this species of kelp should, should occur at. And we're finding it, in fact, the deepest record from our own surveys was down to 77 metres. Uh, CSIRO has done some work and, and showed kelp down to about 80 metres. But just off this one part of the southeast Queensland coastline, not to the north and not to the south. And the last little shot that I have from you, so we're, we're deep enough now that we don't have any kelp at all. This is a, a brov recording, Ian explained what those are. No kelp, but just a very, very frustrated moray eel who really, really wants to get into that bag of bait. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, just let me... Just... A bit like my Labrador. OK. <laughs> we also know, that in reef ecology, that what grazing fish do is very important, and they will select different species of algae, and they will selectively remove those algae, and we wanted to find out what ate kelp. So what we have here is three kinds of algae, one, two, three, with the kelp at the end. Within about 10 seconds of deploying this, these rabbit fish came in and started to absolutely smash the kelp. The clumsy divers in the background, they didn't care about, the other fish swam away. These guys just kept eating the kelp, and that was what they ate first up. Uh, eventually, they had a go at the sargassum. They would never really tried the catenella. They weren't that interested. Within 10 minutes, it was, it was all gone. So we know that these species are going to be important in controlling the distribution of kelp and thereby structuring the whole reef assemblage. I have a theory uh, that these fish are actually teenagers um, and that if you put meat in front of them, they will simply go ballistic. Uh, so this is a meat, uh, a fish-baited bruv. Uh, 
very much like watching teenagers around a meal. You sit them down at KFC, for instance, that's what will happen. On the other hand, try and feed them greens. Yeah, maybe. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Nah. That's not going to happen. Okay. Just to, just to finish up, I haven't been looking at you at the time, so I've got no idea how much I've got left. One minute. Excellent. Um, the last thing that we've been doing here, we've been working with the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service to evaluate how artificial reefs do against the natural reefs that we know a little bit about. So, uh, so we've been evaluating those by using brubs again, by, uh, by deploying divers to look at what's growing on the reefs. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of what we found uh, at this reef up here off North Morton. Not only were they places, uh, and apologies for the quality of the video, that attracted small fish and things that graze, they also attracted some really big things as well. Shovel nose rays, reticulated stingray, and somewhat to our chagrin, uh, bull sharks. Uh, just as a, to give you a sense of scale, this artificial reef unit, now whoever's got the camera here was a little bit distracted. So uh, to give you a sense of scale, this, this box of concrete here is four metres from one side to another. So that's, that's a fairly sizeable bull shark. So what does all of that mean for us? First of all, it's a really, really interesting place and I never get tired of going and finding out more about it. That's something I get great satisfaction from if we drop a camera on a piece of reef that's 88 metres down, I know that I'm seeing something that no human eye has ever seen before and there's something really exciting about that, even if I can't actually go there, but I've got the, the monitor in front of me. Um, it's much more complex than we thought. It may well be much more uh, vulnerable than we realise. There are lots of changes uh, based on our long-term data sets. Um, and patterns that we, we simply don't understand, we do know that it's really, really important that we do understand that those things so that we can make better decisions going into the future. Uh, there's a whole heap of people uh, that I need to, to thank and they're listed there. I also popped this up, so we dropped one bruv which missed the reef completely, but we actually managed to see two humpback whales on a bruv. So, so that's just my skiting slide, really. So <laughs> thank you very much. Brilliant stuff, Tim. Thank you very much. And did you know that Tim was the youngest person at six years, six years old to get a PhD? You've done so much in that 35 years as a young person there. Um, so last, but by no means least, I'd like to welcome Tim Rowe, who combines his three passions of education, science, and Moreton Bay in his role as an educator at the Moreton Bay Environmental Education Centre. You might remember Tim from out the front, where he had you doing your very own science data analysis of predicting today's measurements from the base. So to expand on that and more, please welcome Tim Rowe. Uh, thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, Tim, can I just say, I love following you because he's done an awful lot of work for me. He's explained that Moreton Bay is complex. He's explained that there's a whole lot of things we don't know about it. And he's also talked about the passion that that engenders to try and understand it, to look to gather data, etc. So today, we're going to look at why science is so good for, more, uh, for modern education. Um, I'm an educator. I'm not a scientist. Um, but I'm passionate about science because it is useful education. Um, we want to talk about why Kwandamuka is so good for citizen science and education and why getting students out in Moreton Bay is so important. Um, I'd just like to take a quick moment to acknowledge the Kwandamuka people as the traditional owners of the place where I work, out on Moreton Bay, and give my respect to their elders past, present and future, and thank them for the care that they have given this wonderful place that uh, I call my office. Um, without their care, uh, it wouldn't be the wonderful place it is today. So, oh no, I don't want to go back, I don't want to show you that yet. I can't get back, that's all right. Okay, so um, when I first started doing the Moreton Bay study, we got a new boat. It was very, very exciting. We were able to do all sorts of new things. One of the things we did was uh, we started taking secchi disc readings and temperature readings, which is what you guys have done today. Now, here I have the data from today. 
collected by Captain David. Everyone's got their piece of paper ready? Okay. I'm going to predict, and I'm going to go crazy here, salinity. Everyone has predicted either 34, 35, or 36. Is there anyone in the... Can you put your hand up if you had predicted one of those, please? 34, 35, 36. Can you raise your hand if you didn't? Uh, you oh, there we go. What did you go for? Did you go 37? 33. Oh, interesting. So, okay. Uh, water temperature. I'm guessing that most people predicted around about 17 degrees. If you went 16, 17, 18... Raise your hand. My goodness me. It's working. OK, I'm not going to have a crack at Secchi Disc. The reason I can't have a crack at Secchi Disc is it's way more fun. Salinity stays fairly constant, unless we have a student not using the equipment correctly, which is, you know, there's a certain uh, level of expertise in using a refractometer. Uh, we get some slightly weird stuff. Uh, Temperature tends to follow the pattern. Secchi disc is affected by all sorts of things. And uh, I'm about to get to that point, but first off, let's find out what the actual results were today. The salinity was indeed 35. Ooh. The water temperature was a little bit warmer than I thought. I would have been predicting 17 today. I was out last week. 17.9. Uh, it's had a little bit of a bump at the moment. Oh, and the Secchi depth. I'm guessing from that data, most people were sort of around the four fives. Raise your hand if you're somewhere four five. Not bad, not bad. Okay, except something's happened out there today. Uh, 3.5. It's taken a little bit of a crash. Okay, so this brings me to uh, this graph. The reason I have this graph is I was doing this with a group of year, uh, six students. So they're about 10 years old. And I gave them that data set that you guys had today. Um, they actually only had one year's worth of data. And I said to them, OK, well, what, what can you tell me about the Secchi depth? And this little year six boy said, ah, that's interesting. The Secchi depth is the opposite of temperature. And I went slightly condescendingly, well done. Uh, but of course, you know, the main driver of turbidity is uh, terrestrial inflows from floods and things. So, yes, it'll roughly uh, follow uh, temperature because, you know, we get the bigger rainfall in summer. But, you know, it's probably not the main driver. Then I graphed it, which is why you were supposed to see that slide. Then I graphed it. Oh, my goodness me. So the top one is water temp and the bottom one is secchi depth. And if you put a polynomial, I love Excel, put a polynomial to try and predict it, it's a bit spooky. But there's something sort of weird happening. The Secchi disk seems to be just a little, the maximum seems to be just a little bit in advance of the temperature's minimum. I'm just going to leave it there. I want you to think. OK. It's very interesting, isn't it? So, let's have a look at this. It's very quiet, isn't it? So, I'll con uh, so that's where it was. Cool. Um, I have to admit to a certain amount of jealousy uh, for Tim's bruv shots because often I'm working in less than two metres of visibility. And you can see that's about as good as it gets. Um, but sometimes we see really cool stuff. Um, unfortunately, it's not really good science because I've only got one data point of the shark. Um, we've actually seen a couple of others, but I haven't analysed all that. So, yeah, it, we saw it at Green Island one day. It was really cool. Um, kids got very excited. Apex predator suggests that maybe uh, uh, this habitat's going OK. but. OK, so this is what I do. I work with kids, and they do a whole lot of different fun stuffs. And I'd like to thank a number of people. Um, I'd like to thank Ian Tibbetts for everything. I'd like to thank Tim Stevens for helping me get set up with underwater video gliders. I'd like to thank uh, Russ Babcock and Mike Haywood for helping me set up uh, Bruvs. Um, Anthony Richardson and Julian Riba Palomino to help me with plankton. So, I've got all these lovely scientists who come down 
And it is remarkable the, the passion that they give to their teaching when they come on board with a group of students. And our whole focus is on learning by doing. Okay, where are our study sites? Ah, Green Island. Did you know it's a coral cave? It's a little coral cave. Yeah, a little bit degraded. Obviously, the eastern side's got cleaner water, western side's a bit murky, seagrass, various bits, mangroves in the middle. Lots and lots of fishing. It's probably, I'm guessing, one of the most heavily fished areas in the bay, so close to Manly Boat Harbour. Um, and then you've got St. Helena Island. Uh, no fishing allowed, it's a green zone. So you're gonna think, okay, well, it's gonna be obvious, isn't it? There's gonna be a whole heap more fish in St. Helena Island than there is in Green Island. Ah, only the world was that simple. Um, Green Island, the eastern reef, mined for limestone for around about 30 years. Uh, so it's a slightly degraded habitat. Uh, but you can see we've got um, eastern side, deep or cleaner water. We've got western side, more river influences and creek influences, shallower water generally. Okay, as I said, I'm an educator, not a scientist. So there are some problems with our methodology in that if it's rough, we're going to be hiding behind the island. So we'll only be getting data out on that eastern slope when conditions are good. So there's certain gaps in our data. Uh, school day, we almost always drop our bruvs uh, around about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. OK, why is this important? Uh, I was very pleased to get this little quote from Peter Doherty, uh, the patron of the Doherty Awards. This is why I love science. A number of you, I imagine, have uh, children, grandchildren, etc. I can see a number of young, excited scientists in the audience. Um, we've got no idea what your jobs are going to be, what you're going to be required to learn. What we do know is it's going to change quickly, it's going to be complex. And the people who are good with complex data and can solve problems, they're going to be successful. So that's one of the reasons why Quandamooka is such a useful place for study. It's complex. And science is such a useful tool because we get people to use data. One of the things that's changing in education is uh, we've been moving away from content for a long time. You know, what kids learn is not that important. But now we're getting a lot more drive for um, how we teach, which is good. Um, but we're also getting a lot more drive for, you know, well, what are the skills that kids need, the, the skills that are always there? Um, and they're becoming more interesting. Uh, OK, how complex is Morton Bay? You are smarter together than you are alone. Morton Bay is complex. There's a whole lot of different things there. If I had more time, I'd get you to start talking to the person next to you. But I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to keep quickly going. <clears throat> OK, how much data do we have? We've got quite a bit. OK, this is the bit where some scientists might get a little bit jealous. So in 2014, we had 44, 45 days at sea with students collecting data. 2015, 54 days at sea. 2016, 70 days at sea. I'm guessing this year we're probably going to be over 90 days at sea collecting data. We're collecting from these various sites, we're ending up with a whole lot of bruv data. We're also uh, uh, pulling video gliders to check habitat, we're uh, doing sediment grabs using microscopes, plankton, because it is complex. We, we don't know exactly what's going to be affecting these areas, so we, we want to collect as much data as we can and get the students, the scientists, to start thinking about its complexity and what are the interactions. OK, so as you can see, we got a lot of data. Ooh, yeah. OK, um, that's meaningless, isn't it? And that is where learning comes. OK, so Ian, I know, loves these. We love the catfish. They're noisy feeders, though. And look, there's a little pentapodus down the bottom, little snappers and all sorts. Yeah, OK. Catfish. OK, um, a lot of people are interested in catfish, uh, particularly weird sensory neuro stuff. Where would you find them? You'll find them on the inshore side, if we look at our data. 
So obviously we're looking for that, uh, the shallower water, um, west of Green, west of St Helena. East of Green, east of St Helena, yeah, not so many. Who would have thought? When do you want to go fishing for them? Ah, well, you'd want to go March. Of course, this is flawed data because I'm an educator. We don't go out in the summer. We don't have students. Um, school holidays, we don't go out in them either. Or at least we do for some things, but not very often. So there are some flaws in our data, and that's the sort of thing we expect our students to be picking up on. We want them to look at the flaws in our methodology. There are flaws there. Uh, we acknowledge them. OK, everyone cares about Snapper. And they're noisy. And of course, the, <laughs> of course, the smart, uh, sharp eyed amongst you will have noticed there's two different species there, weren't there? Yes, there weren't actually snap, but there was also some uh, tar wine as well. Okay. Ah, uh, look, and you were expecting more at St. Helena, weren't you? Well, yes. Uh, no. Okay. So at this point, I'm hoping a student's going to go, okay, it sort of looks like something, but is it significant? I need to learn some statistics. But possibly it's got something to do with habitat. And this is just near one of our sites, Green Island 3. And I think this might surprise a few people. So this is inside the bay. It's definitely silty, as John said. Quite a lot of mud. But there's a few live, massive corals, as John said. Um, but it's obviously a complex habitat. Look very closely. There may be something underneath this last ledge that surprised me a little bit. Did anyone see the crayfish antenna? Yeah. Okay, average size of snapper. Uh, St. Helene a little bit bigger, eh, nothing too clear. One of the things we... Uh, might also look at is total biomass at various sites. Are we going to see a difference at St. Helena, which is close to fishing? St. Helena 3, St. Helena 4, we do. I have to make an uh, announcement. Uh, yeah, I've got a dodgy methodology here. I, I got an uh, equation off the internet to change our size estimates um, into biomass. Possibly there's some exaggeration of the larger fish. I'll put the plankton slide up because they're very, very beautiful. Um, but they're also an important driver. They're a very, very useful teaching tool if we're looking at classification, form and function. Uh, we can look at feeding relationships. Uh, and they're amazing. OK, why is science good for modern education? Science is good for modern education because it helps people think. Quandamooka is good for citizen science and education because it's complex. And why is getting students out in Moreton Bay is important. We, we want to in, uh, inspire champions for the Bay. There's a huge difference. You know, obviously, I've been here and I've showed you some stuff, and hopefully you found it a little bit interesting. Um, but imagine if I could get all of you out there. You could be squishing fish into bruvs, um, dropping them down, waiting with anticipation to see what's there, analysing, counting fish, identifying fish, uh, pulling up plankton nets, identifying, etc. You know, the, the real experience is another level above in engagement and in inspiration. So uh, that's what we love. There's our Facebook page. And I'm pretty sure I'm out of time, so I don't think we've really got time for that little bit of video. OK. Back to the start. Thank you very, very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, so we're going to invite our, our panellists up onto stage. They have to carry their own chairs. Um, this is academia, people. Um, we'd like to take your questions now. So if you have a question there, please wave it around in the air. And um, our team will come around and collect those questions. That is a very detailed question. Excellent. Uh, in the meantime, let me remind you that Science will be back next month on the 11th, I think. And we are looking at the war on waste. Sustainability, the role of chemical engineering, and particular focus on polymers and food waste. So it should be a really interesting evening. Um, come along and we really look forward to seeing you there. Make sure you get your tickets early because it will certainly sell out. I'm going to start with a couple of questions off Twitter and then um, we'll, we'll go to the questions from the crowd. First one is for John from Sir Phil of Kent who asks, when you say recovery, do you mean bleached corals are surviving or new <coughs> recruitment? Oh, good question. Um, because recovery would involve both, obviously. Um, when a coral bleaches, 
it doesn't necessarily die. When a coral bleaches, what happens is the symbiotic algae that live within the tissues of the coral are expelled. Now, if those algae come back into the cells of the, into the tissue of the coral, then the coral is likely to survive. But if those uh, algae do not come back, or the coral is too weak or sick to have them come back, then the coral will die. So recovery, but recovery in the sense that I used it mainly with the data that we have, generally meant that the corals that had bleached actually re-acquired their, their symbionts. Right. All right, so a uh, question, and whoever can take it, uh, what does reef bleaching indicate? What? I like how each of you turned <laughs> right down the line and you realise that you're at the but end, you've got no choice. I don't know. I'm John, well, John you're going to... You, 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 you know, it's, I, I, it quite clearly indicates um, thermal stress. Um, there's a few different reasons why corals bleach. They can bleach, uh, but the 99% of the time they are bleaching because of thermal stress. Sometimes that thermal stress is cold water and not warm water. Um, and that's happened, for example, on Heron Island, where we had uh, a very severe cold water winter event, a bleaching event. But in the main, these global bleaching events occur because of global increases in sea surface temperatures that are a function of anthropogenic climate change. Right. And so a question here, is the increase in mud in the bay good news for sea change? Uh, sorry. Sea change. Good news for seagrass and therefore the dugong population. Uh, in the short term, no. So, depending on how intense that that plume of mud is, uh, the, the downside is too much suspended mud in the water column is cutting down the light. Seagrass needs light. Uh, so, if you cut out too much light for too long, the seagrass can't grow as fast. Uh, it also can simply be smothered by the, by the load of mud over the top. But with that said, um, the data from people like Al Grinham from UQ does show that most of that mud that came in during the flood events in 2011, 2012 has now been redistributed around the bay um, and, and is not necessarily causing a problem. So it tends to be a short term issue uh, and it's also putting a whole heap of nutrient into the bay as well. But the, the short answer is a lot of suspended sediment, a lot of mud in the bay is bad for seagrass. I think the other thing is toxins as well, yeah? yeah so yeah, a, lot yeah. Of, a lot of these sediments that are carried down the rivers are actually carrying a large, large toxic load as well. So you're getting a whole lot of bad stuff dumped into the bay. And mm. really, we've got to control that stuff in the catchment about what's, what's going into it. It's not magic. It's happened since folks started clearing the trees and the hinterland and agriculture and... Um, it's got pretty serious now. Yeah. Yeah. Could I, uh, I just uh, jump in there as well. Uh, one of the things I love about science is it makes... It, if you've got the right data, you can make a good decision. So the Port of Brisbane spends a lot of money um, on the Port of Brisbane site, uh, main, minimising their impact. Obviously, you know, there are big industrial stuff in a bad place, uh, but th they work pretty hard at it. And one of the things they do, have got sediment controls. And I'm going to muck up these numbers, but. The basic idea is working on site and minimising their sediment costs them around about $200, $300 per tonne to stop sediment getting into the bay. They've recently done a pilot up the Lockyer Creek and for $7 a tonne, they are stopping sediment from getting into the bay and they're stopping huge volumes by uh, doing creek remediation, making the creeks more resilient to peak flow events. Um, and so using that analysis, um, they're looking that they're going to be spending quite a lot more money uh, doing creek bank remediation, which obviously, you know, helps farmers um, and also helps uh, minimise the impact on seagrass and other uh, light needing organisms in the bay. Right. Uh, Ian, question for you, probably, or others. Uh, does catch and release recreational fishing still impact on the environment? Yeah, everything we do in the environment impacts on the environment. But the, um, it has, I think it has a lesser impact on the environment if you can release the fish you catch. So there's a lot more effort in that nowadays, and there are a lot more programs to support fishers in their ambitions to allow the fish they catch to release. We, we have had massive changes in, in Morton Bay to the, the size of fish that we catch, the numbers of fish that we catch over the years. There are... Um, Newspaper reports from the beginning of the previous century, back in the 
early 1900s of you know, massive catches of very large snapper inside Morton Bay and on the reefs Tim was talking about. That's now gone. We saw the data Tim showed up there, the size of snapper there. We're talking about 25 centimeters. 25 is centimeters. This is a, these, are, these are babies, yeah? So I think, uh, I think catch and release is probably a good thing and really even ceasing fishing for a period might help a lot. Okay. Um, we we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask one more question and invite everyone to head out for food. Well, actually, we're over time, but never mind. Um, and so the, the question which I quite like is, what's the best way for me to get out and see the bay? Buy some floaties. <laughs> <laughs> Go on Tim's boat. <laughs> uh, if you're a school student, uh, definitely talk to your teacher and uh, yeah, encourage them to book with us. There's, um, there's quite a few eco-tours now as well, I think, the operating in the bay yeah. that take you out to... You know, see the mighty dugong herds and look at seagrass and the corals. It's, it's certainly um, more accessible than it was. Yeah. The, those with time, I'd recommend going to a yacht club and uh, turning up on a Wednesday or a yeah, Saturday. Wags, race, wags or Sags, I think they do as well. Wags Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. Um, it's a lovely way to see the bay. Um, is it go to Point Lookout and look out. is a gorgeous <laughs> thing. The, the I brain. can recommend that to anyone. Yeah, yeah. Or, or go to Amity Point. Yeah, yeah. The aptly uh, named Point Lookout. Yeah. One, one thing that constantly surprises me that I, I get my students doing a Bachelor of Marine Science and they get to third year and I say, well, so you've got your dive ticket, right? And about two thirds of them go, ah, I haven't quite got around to it yet. Learn to dive. Get a boat license. Snorkel. Get your head under the water. Yeah, no, it's terrific. A snorkeling at Amity Point, so it's spectacular. Sharks and fish everywhere and corals. Yep. And and you don't, you don't need a big boat, you don't need an expensive boat, you can go snorkelling off, off Scarborough, you can go snorkelling mm -hmm. off North Stratty, you can dive in the, in the seaway. Some of the videos that I showed you with, with uh, grazing fish were just shot in the seaway. You don't even need a boat to go diving there. Yeah, get out and get your head under the water. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I don't think anybody should be floundering for ideas after that. Uh... So on that note, I will uh, join, can you join me and thank all of our fantastic speakers tonight. Tim, Tim, John and Ian. University of Queensland has some small gifts for you which I'll hand at a moment. Um, for now, I'd like you to head out and enjoy the food. Check out some of the brochures about the fantastic workshops and training the Edge has got going on to use all their core equipment and 3D printers downstairs while you're out there. And I'll see you all back next month. Thank you very much.